My name is Sheila Brown and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs. SACEPA is a joint initiative of St. Mary's University and the Atlantic School of Theology and our mission at SACEPA, which is based here in Halifax, although we operate across the country, is to provide an arena for critical thinking, discussion and research into current ethical challenges in our society. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this first SACEPA presentation of 2012, Ethical Issues in Agriculture by Dr. Paul Thompson. This is the first in a planned series on the elements of food, water and oil. Part two on water, if you'd like to mark your calendar, will be on April 3rd at St. Mary's when Alana Mitchell, author of the book Seasick, which is actually about the state of the oceans, will talk more broadly about ethical issues in, in water. And uh, by the by, this Friday at lunchtime at SACEPA, which is on the campus of the Atlantic School of Theology, we have a lunchtime session on social media. The program this evening is made possible by the collaborative efforts of SACEPA, the Evolution Studies Group at Dalhousie, the Situating Science Knowledge Cluster at the University of King's College, um, the St. Mary's Philosophy Department, International Development Studies at Dalhousie, and Mount St. Vincent University. So the format this evening is we will have our keynote presentation. We will then have uh, three brief respondents who will be introduced by Dr. Elizabeth Church, a Vice President Academic at Mount St. Vincent University, who will also moderate the open question and answer session that will follow upon the, the various speakers. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ford Doolittle of the Evolution Studies Group to introduce our speaker, Dr. Paul Thompson. Dr. Doolittle. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm deeply honored to be able to introduce Paul Thompson tonight on behalf of ESG and on behalf of myself for that matter. Um, I prepared a little few notes here about his career, which is very illustrious. It's not very exciting though in terms of the places he was. He started out with a Bachelor of Arts at the University of Toronto, got a Master's of Arts at the University of Toronto, and a PhD at the University of Toronto. Then he became an assistant professor there and worked his way up to principal and dean of Scarborough College. So even though it's a fairly a local sort of career, he went very high in that career indeed, and he became principal and dean of Scarborough College and a VP of the University of Toronto, and director of the Institute of History and Philosophy of Science. So um, that's an amazing uh, academic trajectory, actually, and uh, it hasn't kept him all the time in Toronto. He spends uh, much of his time in Western Kenya, where he participates in a women's collective agricultural project called the Rural Outreach Program. He, in fact, has quite a bit of uh, I guess amateur farming experience himself. He says he killed a few pigs in his time, so he's not naive to the issues of agricultural uh, practice. Uh, if you look at his uh, CV in terms of what he's published, he's an amazingly polymathematical individual. He's published three or four books, but the topics are really quite variable. Um, one is the structure of biological theory, one is on evolutionary ethics, and the other is on agricultural technologies. Um, so he's a deep theorist in terms of how biology works, and we had a, a session with the Evolution Studies Group today talking about the, the uh, topic of emergence in biological theory, or theory in general, in science, and I found it one of the most exciting events I've attended in a long time. I also had the pleasure of being on a panel on the uh, topic of biodiversity that the Canadian Academies ran, in which Paul was also a member, and. Uh, this was about the role of taxonomy in Canadian science and how we could foster that. And I was amazed because even though I knew he was a philosopher, I thought from the way he behaved in the panel, he was a biologist. And I think I don't know any philosophers of biology who know as much as biology as Paul also does. So it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce him tonight. Thank you. Um, well, it's great to be here. Thank you, Ford, uh, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to cover some reasonably controversial topics this evening. I suspect that there will be a diversity of opinion from the three commentators at the end, and I hope that that will lead to a lively discussion 
at the end of the panel and at the end of my remarks. Uh, this is an important topic and one that deserves lots of open and frank discussion. Let me say right up front, I am promoting, and you will see this this evening, a pluralist line on food, which essentially says that we need to have a lot of diverse approaches to food, and any particular fad that we get a hold of and we try to push too far is likely to get us into difficulty. And so I'm actually going to spend a majority, well, a good, a good part of the time, looking at genetic modification, because that's the one that people are the most deeply suspicious about. I'm also going to have some remarks about organic farming. And I live in a farming community, and many of the people who farm around me are organic farmers, or at least they come very close to being organic farmers. And uh, I know the challenges of small-scale organic farming. We're not talking about California, where now organic farming is virtually on the scale of many conventional farms in terms of size. And I'm going to talk about the challenges of attempting to only be organic, and then end with some comments on the locavore movement and aspects of environmental beliefs that people have that need a slight bit of revisiting, I think. So let me start by saying that I'm going to work with an assumption. And that assumption is that conventional agriculture, the agriculture that we've had for the last 50 to 80 years, is utterly unsustainable. And here's one of the reasons why you should believe it's unsustainable. If you go to the World Wildlife Fund website, you'll find these as the environmental challenges of conventional agriculture. It uses 55% of all habitable land, and that's actually been growing after the, uh, over the last 20 years. It's 70% of the use of human water is in agriculture, and about 60% of it is simply wasted in terms of its use for irrigation and its use for animals. It's 70 to 90% of farmers lose more carbon per year than they put back. It has the highest industry use of chemicals, and this is higher than uh, pulp and paper, for example, which uses a lot of quite toxic chemicals. Um, it uh, has the greatest environment, in, environmental impact, when you put all this together, of any other human activity that we engage in. And in terms of climate change, and this is a pretty imprecise number, 25 to 40 percent, and I think here the World Wildlife uh, Fund is trying to indicate how hard it is to get a precise number, but a lower bound of 25 percent makes sense, and an upper bound of 40 percent is probably reasonable, but in that range is its impact on climate change. Even if every factor were to remain the same as today, this impact is unsustainable. But there are two things that are not going to remain the same. The first is the population is going to continue to grow. The second is increased affluence puts increased pressure on food supplies. As somebody who was only capable of foraging or affording a couple of bowls of rice a day, three bowls of rice a day becomes more affluent, they will want more diversity in their food and larger quantities of it, and that's going to drive demand on food. Population growth is really scary. So this is United Nations data. Uh, I've only got 2010 uh, highlighted here. We know that in 2011, we notionally picked a date which was a bit too precise, but we had just passed the 7 billion mark in 2011. You can also see that the very dark blue line at the bottom, is the most developed countries. Countries that I now, because I think the economic designations are better than uh, developing countries or third world countries. So these are the rich countries. The big bulge of lighter blue are the low and middle income countries. And their population is expanding at a dramatic rate. So this is the figures for the United States. And uh, these come from the World Bank. And in the United States, uh, births minus deaths is 0.55% per year in terms of increase. Births minus death plus immigration drives the number up to 0.97. So most of the growth in the United States is, at least half of it is coming from immigration. And then you contrast that 
there's the United States again, with India, where it's 1.381 and almost no impact from uh, immigration, a slight loss because of emigration from India. And then look at Kenya at 2.588. At 2.588, this is what Kenya's growth rate looks like. So in 28 years, Kenya will have doubled its population. And that's just one sub-Saharan African country, and it's a country that's ravaged by malaria, that's ravaged by AIDS, and has enormous amounts of poverty, and yet their population continues to escalate at these dramatic rates. So we face a critical situation as we move forward in food. We're not going to slow this population growth down in any rapid order. No matter what measures we put in place today, it's going to continue to grow. And we're not going to want to stop people from becoming more affluent. That seems to have ethical issues of its own that need to be explored. I like this quotation from Jeffrey Sachs, even though it comes from a book called The End of Poverty. Uh, Jeff Sachs is the special advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations on the Millennium Projects in Africa. Uh, he's worked on a lot of housing projects there. He's a macroeconomist. In his book, The End of Poverty, is an attempt to say we can eradicate poverty in the world. We just have to get poor countries on the ladder of prosperity. And in the book, he says, this is how we got there. We got there through technology and science. Very few people would want to go back to a food supply of 200 years ago in rich countries today, or go back to the kinds of ways in which we eked out an existence 200 years ago. We would be giving up computers, microwaves, we'd be giving up a safe supply, reasonably safe and secure supply of food, if we were to turn our backs on technology. And it's science and technology that's pushed us to where we are today. Has it been without its problems? Absolutely not. Every technology that we have introduced has always needed extreme vigilance, and some of them, DDT being a prime example of a pesticide that we introduced, some of them are simply unsustainable and environmentally damaging. So technologies are not something to just sort of wrap your arms around and say, give me some more of it. Every one of them needs to be introduced carefully and needs to be monitored. And this is the way in which one should think about monitoring technological in innovation, but not just technological innovation, in fact, all kinds of aspects of our lives. And that is to try to figure out what the harms or risks, potential risks might be, and we're clearly going to miss some in technological advances, to mitigate those that we've been able to identify as best we can, to monitor carefully to see what new things are emerging, and to assess whether the benefits we're getting are worth the harms. A nice scheme that I like from a social philosopher, Joel Feinberg, has five elements to this kind of an assessment. So this is not quantitative, this is a qualitative way of thinking about harms and risks. So the first one is that you want to know what the value of a desired outcome is. How valuable is it for you to have this benefit, this outcome? Secondly, what's the probability you're going to achieve it if you engage in some, some technological advance? Thirdly, what's the probability of a harm so, uh, while you're securing this benefit? And fourthly, what will be the severity of that harm? Severity here being a value judgment as to whether or not this severity is something we would like to avoid. And then finally, an element which many an analyses of risk do not put in is, is there an alternative that will get us there without running these risks of harms and capturing roughly the same benefits? And many people have indicated that they think organic agriculture is the way in which we can avoid conventional agriculture and genetic modification, and we can still get the desired goals. I hope that I've at least punctured a little bit of that by the end of today's talk. So let me now focus uh, in on genetic modification, plain and simple, and ask the questions in this Feinberg kind of analysis, ask the questions about benefits and harms. So what kinds of environmental benefits uh, might genetic science and biotechnology provide? 
Well, right now, all the emphasis and focus has been on pests and weeds. So almost all the genetically modified crops have paid attention to either getting rid of pests, and the plants will generate, as I will come to in a moment, uh, an endotoxin that will kill the larval stage of uh, butterflies, moths, interestingly, mosquitoes as well, and that this gives the plant protection, especially plants like uh, cotton from the bow weevil, uh, corn from the corn uh, root borer, and from the uh, corn borer for the ears of corn. It gets direct protection from the endotoxin being expressed. The advantages that come immediately from the, from the environmental side of this is it, doesn't re it requires fewer applications um, of a pesticide in the pesticide side of it because Roundup will kill anything that it touches. It's a broad spectrum uh, herbicide. It will kill anything it touches if it hasn't been engineered to be resistant to the particular pathway through which the glyphosate is transferred. So it's in the phlegm of the plant that the transfer takes place. If it's been engineered so that it blocks that process, it's Roundup resistant, or what Monsanto has called Roundup ready. Because it's such a potent herbicide, it requires fewer applications to kill all of the weeds. It also is the case that a farmer does not have to till the field before planting it if you're planting a Roundup Ready crop because you can allow the weeds to grow and then kill them after you've got little seedlings coming up from the plants. That means you're not opening the soil to wind and, and water erosion by tilling the soil and opening it up destroying all the root structures uh, that um, normally would protect it from erosion. It also breaks down very quickly in the environment. It's much safer than organophosphate uh, herbicides, which are the largest conventional used herbicides. So it's got a very, if you're going to use a, a herbicide, it has a really good profile for a herbicide. Um, it increases yields, and I'll come back to some slides on yields because I've got some separate uh, things to say about yields, but it increases yields, and in some cases it increases yields even while decreasing the actual footprint of the crop that's being grown. And I'll show you a slide with a dramatic example of that with respect to corn, or what the rest of the world calls maize, and pretty much only in North America do we call it corn. In other parts of the world, corn just means a kernel. And, uh, or a grain, so when you get corned beef, it's been salted with grains of sand, which is why it's called corned beef. The products that are currently available that have been engineered since 1995 are soybean, canola, maize, tobacco, cotton, and these are all now Roundup Ready crops. Canola was a Canadian, uh, it, it was a bread mutation, a strain that was a mutant that was then bred, and it just has a much lower level of erucic acid than rapeseed, which is way too high for actual commercial use as an oil. And this is a picture of uh, a glyphosate resistant, a Roundup ready uh, tobacco. So you can see that if you have a very heavy dose of Roundup, the Roundup ready one does better, but they're still both very effective. If you have a normal dose, it will kill the one that isn't Roundup ready, and the other one stays healthy. And then if you don't put it on either of them, but you've plucked the weeds out, uh, these are in pots, so you don't have to do very much plucking, uh, the plants look very much the same as the one that was Roundup ready but sprayed with Roundup. So the current products and uh, advantages of pest control the major pest control is putting into a plant a gene that causes it to express an endotoxin of Bacillus thuringiensis, which uh, the endotoxin works on the gut of the larval stage of a number of organisms. Uh, it causes a rupturing of the gut, in effect, and kills the organism. Bt, the actual bacterial uh, entity itself, is in most jurisdictions in the world, not all, but in most jurisdictions of the world, licensed to be used as an organic spray in organic farming. It's a natural bacterial, uh, uh, the bacterial naturally exists, and it's considered to be a natural background. 
Part of the difficulty with spraying it is you get differential densities of spray on the crops. If the plant expresses it, it's going to be expressed by every plant in the same levels of toxicity. Also, you don't need to use fuel on the field to go out and spray it, and you don't have any residue from the spray, although BT is pretty clean in terms of residue. So environmentally, the benefits here are that you get a much more even application, and you don't have to use as much, typically, and you don't have to use any fuel, and you don't because you don't have to go onto the field in order to spray it. The products that are available are very similar. It's corn and cotton. Uh, potatoes and tomatoes have been engineered, but they're not in very widespread use for two reasons. One, uh, individual consumer acceptance is very low. And secondly, there's not very much money to be made in front-end consumer products of this kind at this point. Uh, there's lots of money to be, pay to be made when you're planting hundreds of thousands of acres of soybean across uh, Canada and the United States. There's not a lot when you've got more boutique products like tomatoes. Uh, potatoes get competitive, but they're still not the same as growing many of the products like soybeans. And here's uh, the difference between a BT expressing uh, plant, this is a tomato plant, and one that doesn't, that's been stripped by the uh, larval stage, in this case of a moth. So those are the two products that are currently available and uh, have been used since 1995. So they've been on the market in your food chain for about 12 to 13 years at this, at this point. No, more than that. Uh, 95 to 17, about 17 years. Almost no product that's come to market, pharmaceutical or anything else, has that kind of longevity that we've been able to study it and to see whether any untoward effects uh, arise. And we haven't seen untoward effects from the use of either of those products in the human food chain. I will talk a, a while about claims of allergic reaction and effects on monarch butterflies, but that's when I'd look at the harm section uh, that, of what these products might potentially bring as harm. What are the products that are very close to release that now are beginning to have other kinds of environmental advantages, drought-resistant crops, crops that will need less irrigation and less water uh, over their lifespan, and if you have a drought, will withstand that drought, are uh, already field-tested and last year received FDA approval in the United States, but I don't, don't know that any have actually been planted in fields at this point. And this is the difference between uh, one with the gene for drought tolerance under drought conditions and one without the gene, the, co the cob of corn. You can see the advantages of yield here, and you can see the integrity of the corn cob. And the, this is just some field trial data on drought tolerance and the degree to which uh, yields are increased over controls with respect to drought tolerance. Another new trait is nitrogen-efficient crops. Nitrogen is one of the most destructive fertilizers that we put into the soil. Corn requires enormous amounts of nitrogen, most of which it doesn't take up. It simply goes down into the groundwater, leaches into lakes and rivers, and eventually gases off as a greenhouse gas. If you can reduce nitrogen levels by making plants more efficient, then you're going to need less nitrogen fertilizer, and this gives you some of the field trial results of the decrease in nitrogen use with its application. So you can see it over the control. Well, actually, the control is barely seeable here, but it's the little yellow line. And you can see what yield results you get uh, with reduced application of nitrogen, event number one being the most dramatic of those events. So... Given these advantages and potential advantages of genetic modification, and given the inevitable population expansion that we're going to see, and the increase in affluence in the planet, having an abundant, safe, continuing supply of food, and affordable food, is going to depend on something like this kind of technology. That's at least where I'm going to go in some subsequent slides. So let me take a look at the yield benefits. And the yield benefits uh, with current traits have already shown dramatic increases. So if you take a look at this chart here, 
and I, I will have to decode this a little bit for you. This is data in the United States. It starts in 1865 because that's the uh, Civil War, uh, the end of the Civil War period, and that was the time at which we could begin to collect reasonable data. And you can see open pollination. There was virtually no increase in yield when you do a, a regression uh, line. When you come to the 1930s, this was after the rise of population genetics and our knowledge of how to manipulate organisms in a much more scientific way, you can see the yield increases that came from double crosses in maize. Now, this needs to be decoded because at the same time, there were lots of other things going on, like artificial fertilizers were being introduced. Uh, it was also the case the United States Department of Agriculture put lots of money into universities to develop extension programs in universities to go out to farmers and help them to figure out what the best planting cycles were, what the best irrigation cycles were. And so there's a lot going on down here that's background noise and not just the science. By the time you get to the 1950s, we're now entering our knowledge of molecular genetics and much better knowledge of how to control tassels on maize, for example, for pollination purposes, and you can see another dramatic increase in yield. Some of this, again, is other technology uh, in terms of increased advantages from fertilization and absorption of fertilizers. Then you get what uh, are termed the molecular bio biotech gains at the very end of the period from 95 onward, and you can see, again, the dramatic increase in the slope of yields. So this is producing vastly more food by the time you get to 2000 and about 2008 on this uh, particular graph. And what's interesting about this is we went from 2 billion bushels in the early 1930s to 11.8 billion bushels by 2006, and the land that was planted in corn went down by 22%. That has got to be an advantage of technology to the environment as well as to the food supply being abundant and safe. And it's not just large-scale farmers. This is uh, the data for a small-scale Indian farmer who's working on three acres of total land and the move over to genetically modified cotton. And India is growing a lot of genetically modified cotton, not very much food stuff at this point, but quite a bit of cotton which they're uh, exporting in a rather aggressive way. So are there any health benefits to genetic modified foods? Well, one of the immediate health benefits is it cuts down on disease to plants which produce toxins, and corn is a classic example of this, and those toxins get into the food supply, and this next diagram will show you what happens when a uh, uh, larvae stage of a butterfly or, a, cat or a, a moth gets into the corn and opens it up so that you can get damage from various kinds of fungi and that gives a toxic residue which is very difficult to get rid of without special uh, treatments and special therefore costs and I might say environmental damage given the nature of the treatment that has to be engaged in. And there's the obvious benefit that we all have a continuing supply of plentiful food at a price that people can afford. Uh, not everyone is in a position to afford uh, uh, food, but most people in North America can afford a wide array of food because of this. New traits in terms of health that are being worked on, and Syngenta is working on a number of these, is vitamin-riched oils and another uh, oil which expresses omega-3 fatty acids, which are known to have some heart beneficial effects right now. The major source is eating fish and, uh, or taking cod liver oil every day if you happen to uh, be out of stomach cod liver oil. And this will give you a long chain omega-3 fatty acids. It will be engineered such that plants will produce oils that are much, much higher in omega-3 fatty acids. Golden rice was an example of one of the first attempts to build in vitamin enrichment uh, it turned out to be a great product, but the squabbling among NGOs, the patent issues around it, just meant that it was vastly less effective than it ever should have been for the areas that it was supposed to help. So here's a summary of the purported benefits. 
Environmental impact, lower pesticide and herbicide application. In the case of pesticides, you don't have any applications at all. Uh, safer pesticide in the case of Roundup and the use of Roundup ready crops. Reduced fertilization, lower nitrogen for example, reduced water consumption, less soil erosion with zero tillage, and less use of land because you can get much higher yields whilst decreasing the footprint that's used for agriculture. Food security, increased yields, and health, higher quality products, and a continuing supply of affordable food. So I've emphasized so far that no benefits are going to come without, the, without some harms. Even getting out of bed in the morning and walking downstairs has risks associated with it and potential harms. This is not a, a world in which you can gain, have a benefit or a gain and not anticipate that there may be a downside. I used to downhill ski. I, I don't anymore because my feet can't take it anymore. But I knew every time I went onto the slopes, I was taking a significant risk by doing that. I tried to mitigate it with good equipment, trying to be cautious, except when my uh, daughters, who were fabulous skiers, uh, told me they were taking me over to a, a blue diamond hill, and it turned out to be a double black diamond, and I had to navigate my way down, uh, probably on my rear end as much as possible to get down the hill. So two issues need to be discussed. One uh, issue is what are the harms that we can currently investigate because we thought about them? And what might be some harms that we still need to work on? And why wouldn't organic be a reasonable alternative to genetic modification as a way of relieving our dependence on very harsh farming practices from conventional agriculture? So let me start by looking at some purported harms of GM. And remember now that since 1995, they have been in the food chain in North America, not, not so much in Europe, uh, very small in Europe until about the last five years, and the European Union has slowly relaxed, without much public knowledge of it, has slowly relaxed its uh, rules on GM so that now there are 12 GM products that are licensed in the European Union and two German companies which have actually produced crops for uh, growth and marketing. Uh, so the EU has changed, and the ch transformation started when Tony Blair about 10 years ago said, the United Kingdom is not going to be left behind in this technological revolution. And then the European Union's discussions began to open up, and it's a very different uh, situation now than it was in 1995 when it was first uh, introduced into North America. But we've had, that means, about 17 years of experience in the marketplace with largely oils in processed food that come from genetically modified crops. So purported harms, some of them we can actually now assess. Other ones we can assess maybe, but they're very hard to mitigate. So let me go through a list of them. Loss of heritage stock. I take this really seriously, but Fortunately, so does the industry, because 50% of Syngenta, Pioneer Hybrid, and Monsanto's business comes from conventional seed hybridization. If they lose heritage stock, they've got no place to go back to for new traits or for an attempt to try to do new hybridization. So they're very keen on seed banking as well. And since about 1960, there has been a real effort both by industry and by governments and by individual non-governmental organizations to engage in seed banking, growing the seeds so that there's not a uh, diminishing of the germplasm of the seeds, so that we always have some heritage stock to go back to. So that's a potential harm, but not just of GM. It's a potential harm of moving new products onto market and having them accepted. And we need to pay close attention, but we have been playing, paying pretty close attention to that. Adventitious presence, this is where something gets out into the environment and begins to take over in a non-natural way. We have seen this with purple loosestrife and a number of other things, uh, songbirds that have been brought from Europe, that once here, they become invasive species because they uh, are in a, an environment in which they can thrive. Aren't GM crops likely to do that? Well, with 17 years' experience, we haven't seen it. And so it's not impossible, 
but 17 years ought to give some comfort that that one isn't as live as a pro a live a problem as it seemed in 1995. There's also another dimension to this, and that is almost all current agricultural crops, GM or not, will not be able to survive in a natural environment. Human tending for most of them is absolutely essential. If I were to plant some cabbages in my garden, I have a very extensive uh, vegetable garden, and never do anything for the rest of the season, those cabbages would never get past a thwarted stage because the weeds would just overtake them. And I did go away for one month in uh, one year for a month in June, and when I came back, it was unrecoverable in terms of what had happened to the garden and the thwarting of the plants that I had put in as little seedlings, and some of them even as seeds. So it's not that easy for something that we have already so modified through hybridization, through ex exploitation of mutations, it's not that easy for that to survive in a natural wild state. Much easier for purple loosestrife to survive because it already has characteristics that make it able to be competitive. It hasn't been altered even by exploiting mutations to get advantageous traits by humans. The development of resistance. This is one of the problems we ran into with DDT. It was not only incredibly toxic as it turns out, but within about three generations, the locusts and grasshoppers that it was supposed to control had shown remarkable resistance to it. So if we're engineering into plants a BT endotoxin expression, how long will that be good? Well, this is another case where industry has a stake in this. It took uh, Syngenta and Monsanto about a billion dollars, a billion two combined, for the research and development to get BT products to the market. They have a vested interest in getting more than three generations out of their BT product if they're ever going to recoup uh, a profit, uh, their R&D back and a profit. And so uh, through the FDA and through Health Canada and uh, Agriculture Canada and a similar organization in the EU, every farmer has to sign up to do what's known as a refuge planting. So 20% of every field must be planted under contract in non-genetically modified crop. The idea here, and we've got population genetic models that suggest 10% is probably adequate, but the idea here is that in the GM area, a very, very few organisms are going to show enough resistance to be able to survive to mating and have offspring. If there's nothing but GM, that's all there will be. And then in the next generation, you will start to see them mushrooming. But if you have 20% refuge planted in one of these approved patterns, you've got a large population of organisms that are feeding off non-genetically modified crops and the outbreeding of the very small number that will survive the endotoxin is going to be large and it's going to take many generations. Population genetic models at 10% of planting suggest it will take about 150 to 200 generations before you will see any meaningful numbers of resistance at 20. It's going to be probably two to three times that long on our current modeling. And remember, organic farmers can spray Bt as a bacterium, as an organic pesticide, and have been for a long time using it, along with the other favorite is Rotenon, uh, and it's, it's a dust that you put on, which is also approved, and you can still call yourself organic. So this, it's out there, and the one advantage of plants producing it is you've got almost absolute control over how much each plant produces as a toxin to do the job effectively of killing the larvae. So what about the effects on other species? We haven't really seen any. Um, and I know that might strike you as surprising because there was a huge wave of publicity about monarch butterflies and the effect on monarch butterflies. And it turns out their populations were under stress but studies that were done by a number of different agricultural schools, and one of the, probably in my view at least, best designed ones was done at the University of Guelph in Ontario, indicated that the factors had, had nothing to do 
with the bacillus thuringiensis uh, endotoxin being expressed. It had to do with quite a few other factors that were much more cyclical in character. And then there's this great uh, quotation, which you should take with a grain of salt because um, you know, he's obviously trying to be a bit funny with National Geographic uh, News, where uh, Mark Spears, who did a lot of the research at the University of Guelph, said, uh, Sears pointed out that he had witnessed more damage to the butterfly population through roadkill while driving along country roads than he did in his experiments with monarch butterflies. Uh, it's, it's worth noting that Spears went into his experiments expecting that he would see a result of the endotoxin on monarch butterflies, either directly because of its damage to the larvae stage of the butterfly, or that it would be indirectly in terms of affecting their food source. And he found neither of those in his experiments, and those have been replicated in a number of other places. Then there's a, so those are kind of environmental concerns. Then there's some agribusiness concerns that, and harms that come up. And these are the ones that worry a lot of us. And these are harms that we have to come to terms with in a lot of different facets. So concentration of control over food and over all kinds of other things in our lives is always something that's problematic. And most people think about, well, yeah, look at what Monsanto and Syngenta and Pioneer Hybrid control in terms of our food. And they, Monsanto, of course, looked really bad for a while in the food part of it. They also looked really bad because they had a pharmaceutical wing at one point, which they spun off and don't have anymore. Uh, but on the food side, because they had the patent on Roundup, and they had the patent on the Roundup Ready genetic technology. So they actually were cornering the market on that. The patent is now up on Roundup. They still produce more Roundup than anybody else. Uh, but it's now being produced generically, and they have written Roundup out of their bottom line down to zero by 2015. So they're no longer counting on that as being a substantial part of their product line. Nonetheless, this is major corporate concentration. But I think we get distracted if we just pick a little favorite sector and say of that sector, that's bad because it's big and it controls a certain amount of whatever. The fact of the matter is Monsanto and Syngenta even more so are relatively small players in the food industry when you take a look at aggregates. When you compare Monsanto and Syngenta to Unilever or to Coca-Cola, they're dwarfs. Um, as I indicate here, the, Unile the, the gross sales of Monsanto are only slightly greater than the research and development budget of Unilever. That tells you the size of Unilever. Is it a problem? Yes, it's a problem. Is it a problem that you're going to tackle by going after GM food companies because they're new boys on the block, or new people on the block, or whatever the gender neutral term would be? Um, no, you're not going to solve this problem. Unilever is huge and controls vast amounts of the products you see on grocery set shelves. Most people don't know it because they go under a variety of different brand names. So Brook Bonds is a Unilever product. And go down the grocery aisle, and it, you have to look sometimes really carefully to see that it's got Unilever on it. And sometimes you have to know which companies are subsidiaries of Unilever to get the, the proper picture. But go on the Unilever site, and you will see there statements about how big they are. They're quite proud of how big they are and how many parts of the world they're in. So this is a problem to be tackled in a much more systematic and global way. And we just distract ourselves if we think that there are some bad, tar bad people and bad uh, entities, therefore we should target them. This is a problem in a much more broad scale way. Then there's the impact on small scale farmers. And I, I did worry about this for some time because of the work I do in Kenya. And almost everyone in Kenya is a small-scale farmer. A few uh, big sugar uh, cane plantations aren't, but most are small-scale farmers, and they're subsistence farmers. And if they have to get their seed from Monsanto, or they have to get their seed from Pioneer Hybrid, so the story uh, unfolds, they're going to be beholden to them, and they're going to be trapped. Well, the reality is that almost 
nobody in North America, no farmer in North America, sources their own seeds from their own products if they're growing on any, any kind of a scale at all. I always buy new seed every year. And I buy new seed every year because I want particular traits. And those traits typically come from hybridization. And if you have a hybrid uh, crop and you keep the seeds, on average, 25% of them will revert to one of the types that were hybridized. The other will revert to the 25% uh, will revert to the other type, and you'll have 50% hybrids. I could barely tolerate that just by you know, digging up the ones that once they actually started to grow, I could see didn't have the traits. But if you're growing anything on any scale, or depending on every acre of your land, uh, every hectare of your land to be producing, you can't have 50% that doesn't have the trait that you're interested in having in your crop. So people go back to seed companies all the time to get the traits that seed companies can guarantee in their seeds. Also, if you keep your seeds, and this is what's happened to cassava, certainly in Kenya, if you keep your seeds from year to year or your tubers from year to year, you find a decrease in the vitality of the crop. And as part of a project, Syngenta, not with genetic modification, but Syngenta has uh, a field, uh, it, it, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, it's going into communities and taking what they call orphan crops, crops that no one's interested in because rich world people don't eat them like cassava, but they're a, a, a source of dependence for people in sub-Saharan African countries, except for South Africa, which I will keep having to say, South Africa is just different in a lot of respects. So they've gone in and tried to increase the vitality by doing selective breeding of cassava uh, plants and uh, collecting seeds. And this is done in order to be part of their outreach. Uh, here's one claim that many of you will agree with and some, some of you may not. But I don't believe that any large company does this kind of stuff out of the goodness of its heart. I've been a consultant for too many large companies. I have seen the behavior of too many large companies, and it's always driven at the end of the day by something they see as in the company's advantage. Even if that advantage is that they get better consumer acceptance in the rich world because they're seen as, being, as doing good things for poor people, if they think that calculation will work, that's going to be part of the motivation for them doing it. So uh, Monsanto is beginning a project in Africa, in East Africa in particular, where they will give the seeds, they will give the nutrients, and they will give expert advice to people in rural villages free. It's all free, given away. If they make a profit at a certain point, then they will pay a small percentage of that profit back to Monsanto. If they make even more profit because they become more marketable, they'll pay more until if they really become profitable, which is highly unlikely in my lifetime, uh, they will be paying the same price as American farmers are paying for the same product. Monsanto's not doing that because it's just simply a good citizen. It's doing it because, like Coca-Cola, who got into China early, once you've got that population on your product, you're a household name, that's where they'll go as their first choice of market when they have the money to actually begin to purchase products. So it's a development of a market. Human health. What's the purported effects on human health? Um, well, allergies, but we've not actually experienced. There are three cases that have been investigated and reported. They do not seem to be related to genetically modified crops. One might just be one case in 17 years. Uh, peanuts make this look uh, like uh, it's, it, there's no al allergic problem at all. Harmful phenotypic secondary effects, haven't seen any of those either. Reservoirs for pathogens, haven't seen any of those either. Should we be vigilant? Absolutely. So what about the organic alternative? Um, I've, I've been promoting GM and saying the harms don't seem to have materialized and the benefits seem to be very good. But doesn't organic have a place in this? Well, I started out by saying I was a pluralist. I think we need to embrace all, and the war between organic and GM is not serving us well. And if you want to read a fabulous book, uh, get a copy of Tomorrow's Table. 
and I can't remember off the top of my head the authors now, but one of them is a molecular biologist at UC Davis, and the other, her husband, is an organic farmer. And this is a dialogue in this book between them. And it's a way of trying to see how a pluralistic approach might in fact work rather than an antagonistic approach to give us a safe, affordable food supply with uh, the advantages that both can bring. Well, a more environmentally friendly uh, uh, agriculture, a healthier agriculture, a more natural, not clear on any of the fronts that those claims can be sustained, and there definitely is a problem of yields. One of the largest impacts of agriculture, and I didn't break it down uh, in the uh, World Wildlife Fund slide, but one of the major impacts are animals, not plants. And it's animal fecal material, it's animal urine, it's the animal feed that's required in order to concentrate the protein in the animal, and all these are characteristics of animals. Organic farmers can't do anything about the amount of flatulence that a cow has. And David Suzuki, although he got you know, absolutely ridiculed about 15 years ago for saying that the flatulence of cows in the Midwest of Canada and the United States contributed more to greenhouse gases than all the cars, he was right. And that's a problem of animals. Not, not, neither agriculture is going to solve that. So there may be some gains to be made on the plant side from organic in terms of environment, but I think they're going to be complementary to GM, and it's going to be a stalemate if you try to uh, trade one off against the other. Um, in the interest of time, let me just uh, point out again the animal urine, animal flatulence, the animal feed, the water requirements of animals, and that list goes on. And we may be able to uh, do something uh, about hormones and other things like that, which would be good, but it's not going to be the panacea that some people think. Um, organic plant agriculture is mostly around not putting on synthetic uh, fertilizers, and this is supposed to be a healthy uh, way of growing plants as well as more environmentally friendly. Probably is a bit more environmentally friendly than conventional agriculture, not so clear when you stack it up against genetically modified agriculture. Here's the one that most people think they're getting a benefit from, and this one is an unknown. So this is the House of Commons Agricultural Committee in the United Kingdom, and it starts out with this kind of ominous uh, uh, sentence. This is not to accuse the organic movement of misleading the public, but it is, it is perhaps true that the public has a perception of organic farming that is at least partly mythical. And then they go on to say that the benefits really have not been established. A similar study from the Parliamentary Information and Research Services of Canada comes up with much the same kind of analysis. We don't really have any evidence to, to justify this. Um, this is by Born and Prescott in the Journal of Food Science and Nutrition, and they're saying that current evidence does not really allow us to make a judgment on whether or not organic is healthier or not healthier. Now, of course, the absence of evidence doesn't mean that there isn't any, and doesn't mean that you're not going to find it in the future if you hunt far enough. But there is a factor that makes it lower in probability that you are going to find it. And this is that assays of various kinds of naturally occurring carcinogens and other toxic elements that plants themselves produce, plants that we eat. Um, most people eat some uh, belladonna alkaloid plants, tomato being probably the most common now. Uh, many plants produce things that have toxic elements to humans and that, in fact, are carcinogenic uh, to humans. The background noise of all that swamps anything that has ever been assayed from commercial growing, non-organic commercial growing, and synthetic uh, use of pesticides. Hence the 99.9% .9 natural, uh, even with all of the synthetic stuff, 99.9% .9 of what we ingest that's harmful and carcinogenic from plants, the plants themselves produce as part of their natural functioning. Um, in addition, the cooking of food transforms it dramatically. And coffee drinkers will not like to hear this, but the number of carcinogens in coffee from roasting coffee beans is very, very high. And consequently, we already interfere with our food 
by what we do in processing it. And that means that it's very unlikely you're going to find dramatic differences between conventional and organic because we're introducing a whole lot of uh, carcinogens into the system. Organic is more natural. This one's, uh, I think, incredibly problematic because it's hard to know what we mean by natural. So if you mean by natural that this is untouched by humans, that is not organic farming. The tomato that we have today has no resemblance to the tomato that originated in the Andes that the Aztecs, probably other groups before them, started to manipulate. But the Aztecs manipulated for about 6,000 years before Cortez arrived. What Cortez got uh, was closer to the current tomato, but not what we have today. The early ones were very small. They weren't sweet. Uh, they had far more of the belladonna alkaloid in them than the tomatoes that we eat today. So if you mean by natural that humans haven't mucked around with it, well, there's no natural potatoes. There's no natural tomatoes. All of these products have been so changed by human intervention that they don't resemble anything in their natural state. So this is the tomato starting out as a small berry. Uh, potatoes in the same way uh, would never have ended up being what they are if humans hadn't directed the process of their trade enhancement, enhancement from our point of view. So no organic farmer is going to turn his or her back on these kinds of hybridized products, these kinds of, especially if you're large scale, these kinds of transformations we've made in the genetic structure of the plant organisms. And a problem of yield, what the bottom part of this shows you is with huge subsidies in Europe, organic farming is still fairly boutique. And it's boutique because organic farming to be really organic can't be done on marginal land. It has to be done on land that, because you're not going to put much fertilizer, certainly only natural uh, fertilizer in the soil. Uh, it needs to be reasonably loamy soil if you're going to get a decent yield out of it. So marginal lands are always going to be problematic for organic farming. So these are not the kinds of numbers, even with massive, in Austria, massive uh, subsidies to organic farming, these are not the kinds of numbers that are going to give us a safe, affordable, continual supply of food. So in a pluralistic society, we need to take advantage of all the tools that are at our disposal. Organic is going to be one, and GM is going to be another, and we're almost certainly not going to be able to completely abandon conventional agriculture, at least not in the short term. But if we don't make steps forward, organic's not going to do it alone. GM might be able to do it alone, but it's a long haul. But with lots of diversity, we will have a much better agricultural template. And then on the locavore thing, I just leave you with three things on the environmental aspects of the locavore movement. Uh, the first uh, one is from the Center for Environmental Strategy of the University of Surrey. And uh, it's talking about how if you actually look at food miles in terms of energy consumption, it's not at all clear that you wouldn't be better to get tomatoes from Mexico than you would from a greenhouse for sure, even if it was only 25 kilometers away. And similar results from the um, Agribusiness and Economics Research Unit of Lincoln University in New Zealand. And, oh, I missed, well, anyway, the other one was from the United, uh, the United Kingdom and uh, studies in the United Kingdom. Hi, everyone. As Sheila said, my name is Elizabeth Church, and I'm from Mount St. Vincent University. Well, I think Dr. Thompson's made it clear that we can't do these simple organic and local good GM genetically modified foods bad, and, to, um, and that we really do need to think about a real close analysis of what are the risks and benefits of, of all different alternatives. And to help us think about it a little bit more, we're very fortunate to have three respondents from three different universities in Nova Scotia. And I'll ask the three of them to come down, and I'll introduce each of them. Our first uh, respondent is Dr. Tarye Tennyson. Do you want to sit here? or do you, yeah. um, Who's a professor of animal science at the Nova Scotia Agriculture College. His research has been on animal behavior and welfare and animal physiology. And his current research is on care farming, 
where people with emotional or psychiatric problems spend time on farms as a form of therapy. Our second respondent is Dr. Bodan Luhovi, who joined Mount St. Vincent University this fall as an assistant professor in applied human nutrition. Before moving to Nova Scotia, he was a senior research associate at the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Toronto, and before that, he was a faculty member at the University of Ukraine. His research is focused on developing dietary approaches to reduce risk factors associated with chronic diseases such as diabetes. And our third uh, respondent is Dr. Rylan Higgins, who also is a new assistant professor, but at, in the Department of Anthropology at St. Mary's University. Before he came to St. Mary's, he was at uh, the Loyola College of Chicago, but the campus in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And his research focuses on the anthropology of food. Each of them will give a short response, and then after, it's your time to ask questions. Thanks. First of all, I want to uh, congratulate uh, Professor Thompson on being gutsy enough to uh, present what is often a, an unpopular uh, uh, stand with many audiences, and also for presenting us with an intellectually and ethically challenging uh, problem to come to grips with. Thank you. OK, my little smartphone has a timer. I'm going to time myself for four minutes. Go. OK. Uh, uh, for, I really, I'm really just going to give four, uh, four points that I want to make from, from uh, Professor Thompson's talk. And uh, two of them are small things. The first one has to do with uh, conventional agriculture, the, your use of the word. And I would say that conventional agriculture, you know, is not a homogeneous enterprise. There are many things in conventional agriculture which are um, sustainable uh, use of integrated pest management to control uh, pests. Uh, uh, crop rotation and other things. So there are sustainable practices and unsustainable practices, and it seems kind of a little bit oversimplification, a bit of an oversimplification to, to, to lump everything together. There are many things that are unsustainable, and that could be a, a calamity, as you point out. Um, the second thing, point, is organic agriculture. And uh, where I work in Truro, uh, our campus also hosts the Organic Agriculture Center of Canada. And the, my friends at OACC would, would probably argue that organic agriculture is much more robust than you give it credit for, that um, organic farming builds uh, organic matter in the soil, and that organic farming practices are therefore the best ones for soil conservation, for water conservation. Uh, admittedly, probably organic farming is not the best for large-scale industrial monocultures. However, um, Organic farming does give more, can, is often on small farms with genetic diversity, uh, I think, and where you have locally adapted uh, seeds and animals, that it can be a very resilient food system, a very resilient, more so than a, a monoculture. Professor Thompson uses the word yield, and of course yield is very important. It's not the only thing when it comes to uh, saving the planet, but yield is important. However, in organic agriculture, I think I have colleagues who would say that organic agriculture often has a diversity of crops. And although the yield of any one particular crop is not uh, so great, the, the total yield of food might actually be more than on a so-called conventional farm. At least that is the, one of the arguments that I often hear. The total caloric yield might be greater. <clears throat> that is point number two. Point number three is a little tiny one, locavore. Uh, locavore is, uh, I'm a, I, I try to be a kind of a locavore, you know, but the reason I am is not because I think of all the, uh, the jewels of energy that I'm saving. It's mostly community, and it's if I shop at a farmer's market or I belong to community-supported agriculture, I am supporting the community. And that's, that, I think, is what drives many people to, to, to buying local. It's, it's supporting uh, you know, those people who are important in our lives. The last thing, three minutes, OK. Last thing uh, is the technology itself. And here, um, I would have to say that, well, I'm not opposed to this technology. Uh, I think that uh, you'd, you'd be blind to not see some of the great things that are happening, and you'd be really ornery to not, have, to not admit that it could help uh, produce uh, food for the world. 
And it's certainly better than, than uh, unlimited spraying of pesticides and herbicides. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the only, I guess I could say the only time when I'm not uh, happy with the technology, if it were, if it is applied to sentient animals, where the questions of uh, animal welfare and so on are, are very important. So, but, but, you know, I was thinking when you gave your talk that all these dogs we have, all these breeds of dogs we have around, uh, if they were the product of uh, genetic engineering over the last couple of decades, we would say they are freaks and monsters. But because they have been with us for hundreds of years, we just call them cute. And, and it's, a, it's a bit of that, you know, that, that things that are new are a bit scary. So there's something like that in there. Um, you mentioned possible harm of, of the GMO technology as being health implications and, and environmental concerns. I, you know, maybe I'm naive and I trust and trusting, but I know I eat uh, GMO food and I'm really not worried about it. I don't think there's a, a big issue with, with human health, at least not that I am aware of. Uh, environmental concerns, I, there is the adventitious presence, the sort of spontaneous popping up of things that it could have some uh, effect somewhere along the line, but not a serious one. The one of the concerns that you mentioned, which I think is most dark and sinister, is the uh, the concentration of ownership and control of food in the hands of a few corporations. That is a thing. If it weren't for that thing, I could almost wholeheartedly embrace all this, but that is enough to, to, be, uh, to be frightening to me, that a few companies would control the products uh, that, that we farmers around the world would use to, to grow their food. Um, there was a recent, oh shoot, I'm out of five minutes. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for introduction and uh, for uh, um, uh, for inviting me to be a uh, uh, respondent on such interesting lecture presented by Dr. Thompson. I have uh, three points that I would like to address uh, here. Uh, first is about nutrition and about nutritional quality of genetically modified food. Um, my concern is what the message we give to consumers. Uh, here in Canada, we have about 59% uh, of people overweight and obese, about 2 million people with uh, diabetes, and another 6 million people have prediabetes or high risk to be a diabetic in a short period of time. And um, many uh, genetically modified uh, crops, if we if we look at Health Canada website, we will find that uh, we have already 70 different food products recognized as novel food, including genetically modified food, that accepted uh, to be sold in Canada. And as many of those food products or, food or crops they have resistance to pathogens, uh, hardiness, etc. Some of them provide uh, better nutritional quality of the food. And Dr. Thompson already mentioned that the canola oil with increased uh, amount of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And another example um, found on Health Canada is uh, pork with omega-3. Uh, so we uh, have, I would say, two choices. First is to provide this food to people, to consumers. And another choice that's uh, recommended by nutrition uh, is to follow uh, Canada Food Guide, which uh, recommend to eat uh, at least two servings of fish uh, once a week. And um, thereby we can get our uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And um, the dilemma is where we can follow uh, both directions, whether we can follow both directions, or we should promote more diverse food choices and balance the diet to our Canadian consumers, who we know uh, uh, who, who do not eat enough fruits and vegetables, milk, etc. And um, another uh, problem uh, is that 
we know that some categories of people buying organic food just because they would like to avoid uh, pesticides, um, gross, uh, a synthetic gross regulator, hormones, veterinary drugs, including antibiotics. And um, those people belong to vulnerable categories, such as pregnant and lactating women, um, elderly adults, children, uh, people with uh, uh, immunocompromised health status. And those people buy an organic uh, because um, according to general principles and management standards of organic production system in Canada, accepted to, in 2009, organic food uh, has no of those compounds. And um, uh, how we can assure these groups of population that uh, genetically uh, modified food has no risks and they can buy and consume it. And um, in fact, we can assure those groups of population that genetically modified food is safe, but only after we conduct very thorough analysis to investigate the safety and uh, all biological consequences, short and, and long-term effects of those food products. And I just want to bring your attention to the um, recent paper published in Reproductive Toxicology by Drs. Aziz Ariz and Samuel LeBlanc from the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec, uh, who studied the blood of 30 pregnant and 39 non-pregnant women. They were looking for a toxin produced by Bacillus thuringiensis. And in fact, uh, they found this toxin in the blood of non-pregnant, pregnant women, and in blood of fetuses. So uh, they found not only uh, Bacillus thuringiensis toxin that uh, Dr. Thompson mentioned in the lecture, but they found some other metabolites as well. And um, the question is, uh, maybe these uh, substances has no any, uh, possess no risk. However, uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, make a strong conclusion whether there is or no risk, we need to do uh, these animal studies to investigate uh, first, uh, whether genetically modified compound can cross uh, a fetoplacental barrier and uh, how they can affect fetal programming and development, whether they can accumulate in the organs and tissues and all other tests. Once we can do that, it will be better for consumers and for genetically engineered food industry because uh, it will be no more question about safety, no more speculation about the safety of genetically modified foods. And the last what I would like to address is uh, regulatory issues. Uh, in fact, um, uh, in uh, Canada, two agencies are responsible for food labeling. It's Health Canada and Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Um, many countries in the world, uh, all European countries, uh, have the regulation where uh, labeling of genetically modified food is mandatory. However, Canada doesn't have such regulation. Instead, we have another regulation, and um, this regulation entitled Voluntary Labeling and Advertising of Food that are and are not products of genetic engineering. This means that a food manufacturer may choose to label its product as a product of genetic engineering or not a product of genetic in engineering. In permitting such labeling, the government is recognizing the consumer desire for more information that is not related to the safety of the product. 
Uh, because a genetically modified organism labeling is voluntary in Canada, it's natural that we can't see any labels on the food. However, uh, my opinion that if we will make um, a labeling of genetically modified food mandatory here in Canada, it will benefit both consumers and genetically engineered food as well because then we will have uh, a better opportunity to monitor these food products and in fact this can, st this can establish something what Health Canada calls the safe history of use and uh, if there will be a safe history of use this will benefit both genetically engineered food and consumer. So I think more transparency in these uh, uh, aspects will help both consumers and uh, genetically modified food industry. Thank you. Well, I guess I have to stand. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, here's your phone. I have my own timer. Uh, so I'm angry. Uh, Paul is a nice person, and he knows a lot more about this than I do, and he um, said some things that I actually agree with. Even, even, and this has made me angry um, in the sense that we had dinner together and shared um, a glass of wine. Um, that said, he did sort of give us um, free reign to uh, attack him tonight in the sense that you said it's been done previously and you've sort of enjoyed it. <laughs> <clears throat> so in that vein, um, I'll start with a metaphor. Um, we're probably, I guess most of us are familiar with oh, the rather odd and, and, and rather brutal uh, saying that there's more than one way to skin a cat. I always wanted to know where that comes from. Um, but here the metaphor refers to, I, the skinning of a cat refers to producing, and this is important, all right? Um, lots of certain kinds of crops in a particular way, which is without pests and without um, weeds and for profit to me, meaning lots of money. All right, that's, that's the, the way we're sort of envisioning the skinning of a cat here, all right? And so the two ways that we've heard that you can do that are via GM or conventional farming, all right? Well, my point, and this is from a dog lover, let's don't skin the cat at all. Why should we be skinning the cat is my, my point. All right, so this is the fad that I find the most troubling, all right? Um, and it goes back a very long time. It's not a fad at all. Paul and I actually talked about this at dinner tonight. It goes back about 10,000 years. This is the anthropological, um, archeological perspective on it um, when we started agriculture. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that the crops that have been dominant are kind of the same. They're maize and uh, soy is new, of course, but they're the annual grains for the most part, all right? Um, and they've been important because they're storable. They're tradable. They're those kind of commodities like oil. I don't think there's any um, uh, uh, there's no serendipity in the fact that they're, they're both such powerful um, parts of our current experience. Um, and yet, They've also produced things like higher gender inequality. Um, inequality in general has increased in these 10,000 years. Greater population densities. You could argue it's produced greater population, one of the problems we're trying to solve by continuing the fad. Um, and undoubtedly, from if you believe archaeologists, our bodies, the skeletons of the bodies um, that we've um, unearthed since agriculture are, um, by, again, archaeological records, undoubtedly less healthy. All right. Um, so my questions, of course, are like, well, why do we want to continue with this fad? It's the main thing that comes up when I think about these things. Um, furthermore, do we want to add yet another tech fix to the process, which is what we've been doing for about 10,000 years? And this is what I see GM as, yet another tech fix along the way. Um, what I see as important, and I can get this all under four minutes, I think, is the need for a cultural shift. And I think that's the biggest piece missing so far tonight. Um, a, a few things that are quite straightforward and simple, um, not to, to implement, I don't think, but at least to conceive, uh, are reduction in food waste. This could be related to a second one, eating seasonally, 
All right. Um, a third one, not caring about food, the food uniformity that we heard a little bit about tonight. All right. Um, on a grander scale, this notion that growing affluence and growing population are inevitable and irreversible. All right. I think it's something that we do have to check. All right. Importantly, because if GM foods are the only thing we have going for us, and we continue to overconsume and expand as a population, then getting enough food is going to be one of many serious issues we face over the next 50 or 100 years. Um, inevitability of these two things is not something we should take and say, well, because it's inevitable, um, we'll move forward with GM crops. All right? um, we have to think of different solutions. Thanks. Thank you very much. So now it's your turn uh, to ask questions. It's not really a question as much as a concern about the sense of some comfort that it's been 17 years and we haven't seen harm. And I'd like to take us back to tobacco where it was safe. There was no evidence that tobacco was causing any harm to anyone. And it took 50 years for society to acknowledge that in fact it did and for us to develop the science to be able to prove that in fact it was smoking causing significant lung cancer as opposed to all the other carcinogens or other issues that can affect such a complex organism such as the human body. So I'm really concerned when as well we say, well, organic farming hasn't shown that nutrition is better. I always wonder why the large corporations don't have the obligation to do the science to in fact show that genetically modified food isn't in fact safe. So don't become complacent with 17 years, it may take 50. And we should demand, in my view, that the corporations are looking for that science as opposed to the environmentalist or organic farmers. Yes, I'm advocating anything but complacency, although 17 years is a long time for almost anything we've investigated. And let me, let me say about tobacco, we actually knew by the 1930s that tobacco was a problem for emphysema and was likely a problem for lung cancer. In the early 1950s, Dolan, um, oh, the other name's gone from me. It'll come to me in a minute. Hill and Dahl published a study that should have been definitive on the effects of smoking on lung cancer. The statistician who poo pooed it and whose methodological design we still follow today for doing randomized controlled trials was R.A. Fisher, who wrote an article saying this was utter nonsense, that they had not shown anything other than a simple correlation and that that didn't establish it. So the early warning signs were there, and we chose to ignore them in that case. And I, that, that modifies your point about tobacco, but doesn't undermine that we cannot be complacent. I, I fully agree with that. On the issue of companies doing the work, the nutritional studies are just very hard. I didn't put some of the experimental design problems up with doing the nutritional work. Companies are required to show uh, to FDA standards, the same as pharmaceuticals, that there is no detectable harm at the level of the randomized controlled trials. We never know anything, in my view, until it's out in the public and you begin to do what are effectively phase four trials in a general public. Randomized controlled trials do not give us very much comfort, even if companies were to do them. So. Uh, not being complacent and monitoring things is incredibly important. And I take it that was one of your main points, although you and I probably differ on just how much people are doing to actually not be complacent. Thank you very much for the lecture. It was a lot of fun. Um, my question is, why do you not address the question that is causing that which you want to fix? There's this huge bump in the population development. And I don't know exactly where I read it, but if you gave women in the third world countries education, their, the number of children that they have will be considerably lower. So I wonder, 
Why the, the quick fix in the culture issue, I think, was a little bit, you didn't cover it. Yeah. Uh, I didn't cover that, and that's a fair question. Uh, the, the answer is less, uh, no, I don't want to put it this way. Education is going to be a really important part of fixing this problem. But what we have learned in uh, rich countries, or what are typically called Western countries, is that the single biggest driver of population decline is affluence. As people ha are, have more resources and are more affluent, and along with that, better educated, the number, the birth rates go down. Education, when I, with the work I do in Kenya, indicates you need both prongs. So with older women, it's actually getting them to a stage where having children is not an advantage for any kinds of economic and security measures. For young girls, education is important to get them so they're not in that position in the first place. I guess I just don't think we're going to be able to do this fast enough. I mean, I, I, when I'm over there, what you're suggesting is exactly what we should be doing, but it's a long process. And uh, so we've got to keep at it. We've got to keep doing it. And if we, don't, if we don't fix the problem, that bulge is going to look even scarier when we look at it in another 10 years. And we've got to start uh, dropping it, not just leveling it out, but dropping it. And that's one measure, improving people's lot in life and educating, especially women. Uh, I only work with women's groups in Kenya, and there's a reason for that. That's where you get the most effective change in people's attitudes and behaviors. Uh, women really want to do something. Can't say that about my own gender, and that, that probably that shames me that I have to say that. Hi, um, I just sort of made a few notes that I'd love to share and then hear comments from um, anyone on the panel. Um, I, I enjoyed at the beginning of the talk when you um, spoke of uh, Feinberg, I'm not sure if I pronounced yep. that right, Feinberg, uh, and said that you, we also need to look at an alternative way of reaching the same means or reaching our desired means. I don't think that uh, what you shared with us tonight does that. I think that this is another, a newer version of the Green Revolution, which wasn't green at all, and which has had very damaging effects on the world, although on the graph you showed may have increased yields. There's a lot more to the story than just increased yields. Certainly we haven't uh, increased our um, level of income in, throughout the world. We haven't leveled that out in any way. And so, you know, if there are more yields happening, it's certainly not reaching everyone equally. Um, and um, when you shared various um, uh, numbers or statistics and graphs, I was really curious uh, where they came from because I think in most cases I've seen things that spoke to the exact opposite results. So saying that organic food has uh, no, there's no evidence to say that it is more healthy. I'm sure that I have read and maybe, maybe from a less credible source, uh, but that's debatable. Uh, information that said the exact opposite, that said organic food very much so does have uh, better, more nutrition, better quality, less uh, chemical uh, residue, things like that. Uh, so that was one example of that. Also, um, when we're talking about increased yields and then we hear um, perhaps it's anecdotal evidence, but stories of farmers who are part of uh, organizations such as La Via Campesina, and uh, they are committing suicide in countries, for example, India is often the one that's referred to, because they are trapped in this cycle with companies such as Monsanto in terms of uh, a treadmill where they're buying seeds and growing plants and never getting on top of the game. Uh, and so in the end, they not only can't afford uh, what they've already bought, they're in debt, they also have ruined their land from this so-called you know, technology. Uh, that's supposed to be beneficial and so they in the end take their lives in that moment of desperation which is certainly not I think anything that anyone wants to see. Um, also when we're talking about these these products they uh, typically are not food they're um, as the nutrition the person who spoke to nutrition as you had said they are primarily oils or things that are found in um, 
uh, processed foods, which is certainly not the kind of food I want to see more people in the world eating. It's not healthy food. Um, and in many cases, these aren't even foods. You're talking about corn, which is used for animal feed. You're talking about uh, biofuels, talking about sugar beets, which is made into sugar, and cotton, which is not a food. Um, also, I guess a, just a last comment then. Um, certainly organic agriculture takes uh, a lot of time and energy. I spent the summer on an organic farm and it was a huge amount of work and a huge amount of time and I often thought how much easier it would be to spray things. Um, but there are a lot of farmers who understand that that is not the way to have a sustainable future. And uh, I just think that that's really important. And I'm really excited so many people are here, but I'm scared that the lesson people are going to take away tonight is really not a very ethical one and not something that was um, fairly discussed. So thank you. One of you would like to respond? Uh, well, I'll start, but I don't want to be the only one that's, <laughs> that's taking the microphone. Um, you made a lot of points, and I'm not sure I can remember all of them. Um, the, the Green Revolution is highly controversial. The point that you drew from it is a more generalized point. Uh, again, going back to my experience in East Africa, not, not just in Kenya in this case, in the last 15 years, uh, forget about agriculture, just in terms of money that has been taken in to those countries by non-governmental organizations and money that has been given by foreign governments from rich countries, there has been something around the neighborhood of 11 to 12 billion dollars that's gone in. The poverty rate in each East African country has risen in every single one of those years. So something is not effective, and this, is, this doesn't involve food. This involves a whole range of other inputs, and a lot of it has to do with the way in which the aid is delivered, the education is delivered. Uh, it's highly tailored to benefiting a Western encroachment on those countries. So uh, I think this is a big and large problem. On the suicides in India, I could give you four or five papers produced by Indian research agencies independent of the government that gives a reason why those suicide rates are there and they have little to do with agriculture and a lot to do with a whole lot of other structural issues within the society. That's not to say agriculture isn't a piece of it, but that didn't turn out to be very dominant in these studies. And at that, I better leave it. I guess I just wanted to suggest maybe you change your title to genetic modification, organic, and local work, considering like the amount of time you spent on each topic. But um, I have two questions. Fair enough. That's fair. <laughs> That's absolutely fair. I kind of got rushed at the end, but even so, GM would have occupied more space. Yeah. Um, so I guess since you have the correlation, or you argue the correlation between afflu affluence and um, and population, but increased pop okay increased amounts of affluence is going to i guess kind of be correlative with the um, increasing of consumption as well so why would we want to um and obviously increased consumption isn't sustainable so why would we want to jump into a technology to sustain something that is unsustainable and also um what how do you um plan to test for um potential negative effects in future generations of consumers that have been consuming genetically modified food. So like my great-great-grandchildren, if they all eat genetically modified food, how do we test for those potential deleterious effects? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have no answer to the last one, uh, except that that's the position we're in on all kinds of things. I have no idea what lots of things we're doing, including, I mentioned microwave ovens. Uh, they seem pretty safe now after, what, 30 years of them being on the market, but I have no idea what they might do downstream. And pharmaceuticals that we release, it's a very good question, but I, it's just, that one's almost intractable. Your initial point is, is the challenge. And I don't think this is a plastic answer because there's too many variables all at play. So if you don't increase affluence and you have population increase, it's going to put 
pressure and demand on the resources of the planet, not just food, but the resources. If you do increase affluence and you decrease population, you're going to put the pressure on from another source. So this one's a, this one's a hard one, and as a number of people who've come to the microphone have said, it's one we've got to wrestle with. I don't have any quick answers for how you wrestle with that underlying cause. This is essentially your point, that we almost need to use a way overused phrase. We almost need a paradigm shift in the way we think about population, about our consumption patterns, about what we consider to be affluent and a good life. And I just don't know how to begin to get a purchase on that. And I'm not sure you do either, but you certainly... I don't, you know. I don't, but I want to add a point that's... Hello? Is it on? <laughs> Uh, related, sort of, I guess, and it, but it gets back to sort of what I was saying um, at the very beginning of saying that what I agreed with you about, and I want—I guess at this point, given that the questions have been um, kind of more attacks on you, uh, <laughs> say what I do think is important to recognize is that, uh, and it comes from a story, I was in the Mekong Delta at a conference on agriculture, um, trying to move towards more sustainable, environmentally friendly agriculture, which went absolutely nowhere in the course of this conference. Um, and I made the suggestion at some point that, well, because what the, what the Mekong Delta does is it grows rice for you. It grows rice for everybody. It grows the second largest export of rice in the world next to Thailand. And it grows all the rice that came from the Green Revolution, uh, highly uh, dependent upon petrochemical inputs of a variety of natures. And I said at that point, well, why don't we just start growing, not we, because I don't grow rice there, but why don't the farmers just start growing vegetables? And it's because they couldn't do anything with them. And, the, and, the, and that the people in Indonesia who are poor and can only afford the low quality rice that Vietnam sells would, would go into serious um, sort of uh, food security crisis if that was to be the case. Um, and that indeed, if the people in the Mekong Delta had a rice crop that was genetically modified that didn't require all those things, we would be better off. I hate to admit that, but it's true. Thank you for a uh, very empirically based uh, presentation. Um, it was it was quite an. I, I felt the facts around GMOs were were presented very uh, based on empirical evidence, which isn't necessarily something you come across all the time. Um, I think that one, the the issue that I would like to address is the energy intensiveness of of our agricultural systems. Genetically modified organisms are, are essentially a tool that we can choose to employ in any type of agricultural system that we we. Uh, use. As, they, as it has occurred to date, we've tended to employ genetically modified organisms in traditional agricultural practices. Um, your graph there at the beginning showing the ex exponential increase in, crop, in corn production, I would suggest has as much if not more to do with the increased use of fossil fuels as it has any sort of other um, agricultural uh, development in, over that time span. Um, that being said, I was wondering if you could comment on the sustainability and the long-term sustainability of the use of, of current uh, genetically modified agricultural systems under a $200 barrel of oil compared to, say, small plot intensive organic -based, uh, a small plot intensive organic-based agricultural system. Yeah. Uh, Oil is going to be an agricultural difficulty. Uh, it already is uh, skyrocketing the cost of agricultural inputs. What's offset it for you at the grocery store is the fact that yields have gone up quite dramatically for other things that have happened in agriculture. So farmers have been able to realize sort of the same amount of money in return, uh, but even though their costs have gone up in the case of oil. Can we get off oil in agriculture? I guess I hope so, but I don't see at this point how we're going to do it. I'm not sure how GM would help on that particular front. Uh, oil is eventually going to get more, more expensive rather than cheaper. And our current agriculture for G GM agriculture, you're quite right, is just taking plants that will give you a greater yield using the same agricultural techniques, which is a lot of petrochemicals along the way. Fewer maybe than some conventional agriculture, because I take your point that 
that, that's a big brush stroke when you say uh, conventional agriculture. Uh, so uh, somewhere we're going to have to find a way of intensifying in the same way as I've done a lot of work with uh, environmental organizations on urban sprawl. And it may not be a problem here, I don't know, but in the greater Toronto area, urban sprawl is just paving over everything. And it's uh, ticky-tacky houses, as Pete Seeger called them, all over the place. The only way we're going to be able to sustain the population of southern Ontario, never mind it growing, just sustaining it, is to intensify our land use uh, to make it much more effective and efficient. And I think that's what we're going to have to try to do with agriculture. I just don't know that we currently have the template for doing it, but it's a good question. So thank you very much to our speaker, Dr. Thompson. <laughs> and, and our three respondents, Dr. Higgins, Dr. Lahovi, and Dr. Tennyson. And I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors for this evening. I hope I get all of them. There's the uh, Evolution Studies Group at Dalhousie, the Philosophy Department at St. Mary's, Situating Science Group at University of King's College, International Development Studies Program at Dalhousie, Mount St. Vincent University, and SESEPA. And I'd like you to invite you to a uh, reception out in the atrium uh, where we can continue the conversation. And I was also told that we have some SESEPA DVDs from previous lectures uh, available for you to pick up outside. So thank you very much everyone for coming. <laughs>